We're in part three of our series, and I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that we will conclude the series officially today, but I will continue this series online uh, in our private Facebook group. I uh, don't know when I'll post it, but coming up in the next week or two, uh, if you're not in our private Facebook group, all you got to do is search in your groups of Facebook for Solid Rock Church. You'll see us there. You must request to be a part of it. You must be approved to be a part of it. They'll ask you just a few questions. Do you attend Solid Rock Church? Things like that. Why? Because this group is, is reserved for people who attend Solid Rock Church because we're going to talk about things in there that we don't talk about to the public. Uh, but I'm going to answer some of your more heated questions there in a Facebook Live inside that group a couple of them that will not be, it will be private. They will not be shareable. Uh, we'll make sure that you cannot share the video. Why? Because it's going to be just for our people in there. So if you're not a part of that group yet, you can, you can request to be a part of that group. Uh, and we'll keep you up to date on when we're going to do that. But today our opening scripture, and I got to go quickly because I got four questions I'm going to try to hit in this service. I only got the three in the first service, so pray for me. But our base scripture of this series is 1 Peter 3.15 from the King James Version. It says, be ready to always give an answer. Everybody shout an answer. answer. An answer to every man that asks you to a reason for the hope that is in you. But when you answer it, answer it with meekness and fear. The Amplified Version says the same scripture this way. Always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope that is in you. But here's the key. But do it courteously and respectfully. So you've got to be able to answer the hard questions, but if you answer them with a spirit of anger or with a spirit of bitterness, then it's not even going to matter if you have the right answer, they're not going to listen to you. So God said there's a way to answer these things and to answer them with humility, answer them with the love of God as much as possible. But how many knows you can answer with as much love as possible, but it, some people are just going to be offended anyway. Amen. So I'm going to do my best not to offend you. But a couple of things I want to tell you, I want to remind you of that I've talked about every week in this series, is that all questions have been submitted by you, people in this church. None of these have been made up by me. Uh, the questions are ran answered randomly, no specific order, not like a typical sermon. Some questions are a little spicy, a little dicey, uh, PG-13, if you will. I'm not going to do the rated R ones in here. I'll handle them in the Facebook group. Uh, some, qu some questions I'm just sim simply going to give you my opinion and say this is my opinion. I'm not a Bible expert. Um, some people are afraid to say, I don't know. I'm not afraid to say, I don't know. If I don't know, I'm going to tell you, I don't know. And you can take it or leave it. And another thing that is a model of our church that we talk about all the time is this. If it makes sense, if the literal sense makes sense, then any other sense is nonsense. So if the word of God is clear on something, I'm not going to try to make it say something that it doesn't say. And the ground rules, uh, which are four quick ground rules for this entire series, it should be the ground rules for anything in your life, should be the ground rules for any interpretation of Scripture. And the number one ground rule is that the Bible is the final authority. Can I get an amen? amen. Not me, not your pastor, not, not, not your bishop, not your denomination, not your co-worker, not your mama, not your daddy, not your granddaddy, just because he was a pastor all his life, just because your granddaddy said something, if it ain't in the Bible, then, then it don't matter what your granddaddy said, amen. I love your granddaddy, all due respect for grandma and granddaddy, but if they're trying to teach you something that ain't in the Bible, you got to still love grandma and granddaddy, still respect them, but you need to go by what the Bible said. Can I get an Amen. That if the Bible speaks clearly on a subject, we will let you know that the Bible speaks clearly on it. We will use the scripture, explain the scripture, and then move on. If the Bible does not speak clearly on a subject, we will do our best to see if the scripture alludes to it. Um, and, and, and if we can find where it alludes to it, then we'll learn from those principles. And, and lastly, if the Bible does not even allude to it, then we will look at that question from a moral aspect, from a cultural principle aspect of how... A Christian should probably look at things, look at that question, and then I will give you my opinion, and you can take it or leave it. All right? Y'all ready? If, you, if you're ready, shout, I'm ready. ready. Woo! Y'all good. Y'all helping me, praise God. I need that spirit of Ric Flair to come on me today. Woo! Stretch your hands this way and say, Jesus, Jesus. use my pastor. Use my pastor. Amen. Amen. Question number one. Is drinking alcohol a sin? I'll drink, I'll drink to that, praise God. Now watch this. This scripture, I mean this question, is asked every single time that we've ever done this over the years. So that means that some folks are 
Won't know the answer to this. Right off the bat, the question is, is drinking alcohol a sin? Is drinking alcohol a sin? Immediately, it may shock you to hear your pastor respond, the Bible does not say that drinking alcohol is a sin. The Bible does not say that drinking alcohol is a sin, but it does say that being drunk is a sin. Or do you understand? It does not say that drinking alcohol is a sin. I'm sorry. It's screw- you want to you believe that? That's fine. But the reality is this. Just hear me out. The scripture does not tell us that it is a sin to drink alcohol, but the Bible does say that it is a sin and it is not his will for you to be drunk. Are you with me, church? Ephesians 5.18 says this, do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, I can't even say that word, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, the, the New Living Translation helps me understand a little bit better. This is the same verse. It says, don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, let the Holy Spirit fill and control you. That's the key words there is fill and control you. How many of those God doesn't want anything to control us but him? We, we're supposed to be led by the Spirit, right? Not led by anything that is man-made. Now, and is man co- conjured up. Please understand that when you get to this question, and, and people have asked me this question, like I said, every single time, and when I talk to them or share with my opinion, this is a response that I get, and I believe this is a very dangerous doctrine. And how many of those people are very good, over, especially people in the church, are very good at taking a little bit of Scripture that somehow makes, makes them feel better about themselves, and then they construe a saying around it, they, mis, they tweak, tweak a word in it to make it fit them, or they might even build an entire doctrine around it. And it may be in Scripture, and it may be alluded to in Scripture, but they take advantage of it. One thing that scripture certainly speaks to and alludes to in other places is that whatever you do, to do it in moderation. So now we've developed this mentality. Listen, don't judge me because I live my life by this philosophy. Everything in moderation is okay. As long as you do it in moderation, it's okay. So that has become a justification in people's mind to do whatever they want to do as long as they do it in moderation. In other words, they don't, they don't, they don't get high so high on a drug that if they black out. They just get a little buzz, or, or they don't get drunk. They just take a drink, or they take a, a few drinks that makes them feel a little bit more relaxed and all this, but they don't take it that far, so it's in moderation. You know, and they go on and on. They use that as their saying, everything in moderation. Well, the example that I like to give is, okay, everything is a big word. That means everything. Well, what if I committed murder in moderation? People are like, you're going to jail because you, you killed somebody. I don't kill people every day. I know it's an extreme example. I understand I'm not trying, I'm sort of trying to be funny, but I'm trying to give you a point that you can't enca- encapsulate everything in your life under one statement as long as it's in moderation. Some things is true as long as it's in moderation. Some things one time is wrong. Okay? So you, and, and if the Bible speaks clearly to it, then you need to really consider that. See, think about this. If being a drunkard is, is the biblical word that's used for a drunk, if a drunkard is a, is being a drunkard is sin, then you have to ask yourself, why are we so motivated as believers to find justification to do something that even though it's not sin, even though the Bible does not say it's sin, but you still can't do, if you don't do that, you can't be drunk. So in other words, you can't be drunk unless you first start drinking. So what happens is most people cannot discipline themselves to stay in moderation. Am I preaching good? Because especially when something bad happens, when they're dealing with stress, when they've had a bad day, their moderation meter is messed up. Because on a good day, your moderation meter might mean, mean a half a glass or whatever. But when your boss has been crawling your rear end all day long, moderation might mean three or four glasses. Amen. So that you can just be woo, dancing around your living room feeling good. Okay, I'm not trying to judge you. I'm just trying to tell you. You can't use moderation 
as, as, the, as, the, as the, one, the thing that you always go to. Oh, my goodness, y'all, y'all tough crowd this morning. Can I get an amen? See, some of y'all, I'm moving on. Okay. This is what I hear, too. Well, brother, you especially hear this down here in the south, and this is the way they talk when they say it. Brother, all I know, I love the good Lord, and I believe in the good book. In the good book, and the man upstairs said this. I didn't say it. First Timothy 5.23. By the way, they can't never tell you where it's at. 1 Timothy 5.23 says, take a little wine for your stomach when you got stomach troubles. They can't quote it, but they don't realize this. Paul saying, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Watch, watch what he was saying. See, when we read that, we're like, well, you know what? I've got a stomach ache. So, it's amazing to me, man. You, some of y'all had a stomach ache for about 30 years. But here's the reality. When you read it in context, you understand that he was speaking to a time when it was very unsafe to drink the water in that time. It's still unsafe to drink the water in most places in third world countries. You go on a mission strip, the first thing they tell you is no matter what you do, don't drink the water. Don't even brush your teeth with the water. You have to brush your teeth with bottled water. You can't even put it on your lips. To this day, in 2018... In that time, it was, it was absolutely an epidemic problem with the water. Notice, notice he didn't tell him not to drink water. He said, look, you cannot just drink water. It will make you sick. So in that day, many people drank wine instead of water. That was a cultural thing because the wine and the fermenting process had killed any of the uh, diseases and anything that was in it. So it was safer to drink the wine than it was to drink the water. And people that only drank water had epidemic stomach problems. So now you got Pepto-Bismol. The next thing is this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 says this. All things are lawful for me. Listen to what Paul says. But all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Did you hear what Scripture just said? He said, look, I understand that it is lawful for me to do anything I want to do. God's not going to judge me. To, well, certainly unless he specifically called something like a sin, like thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not commit murder. He's saying outside of those things, I'm pretty much, if it's not spelled out, this is a thou shalt not do under grace, I am pretty much am free to do whatever I want to do. But Paul is trying to say, but wait a minute, even though you are, that doesn't mean that it's going to be beneficial and helpful to you. Listen to what the New Living Translation said in that same verse. You say, I am allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. And even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. Man, that's good preaching. Just because it may not be explicitly forbidden doesn't mean it's beneficial. You all the time see things on the news where, you know, drink a glass of wine here helps your heart or helps different things or drinking a beer will help, help with your heart and all this kind of stuff. And the good old boys will be like, woohoo, I love this newscast. <laughs> but how many knows you skip a couple of years and all of a sudden they're telling you, well, we got that wrong. It's really not that good for you. Skip another couple of years. They're telling you, oh, wait, we got it wrong. It really is good for you. So the reality is this. I, I'm not debating whether there's health benefits or not. There probably are health benefits of it. That's not what I'm saying. But I also know on the flip side, it destroys brain cells. It destroys livers when you become a drunkard. I understand it's not taking a casual drink. Kidneys have shut down. Organs have shut down. It is very destructive in marriages. It has destroyed marriages. It has destroyed the lives of children. It has caused fathers to abandon their, chil- abandon their children because they've allowed it to get to a place to control them. And that's what Paul was saying. We are not to be controlled by anything in the world. Isn't it, isn't it interesting? I'm going to say this and quickly move on. Isn't it interesting that if you were to go uh, and buy uh, something at one of, the, one of what they call the package stores, it's interesting to me that even in flashing neon lights, they will have on their sign, get your spirits here. I used to always think, man, if I was going to sell something, I'd at least take that down because I know what they're saying because culturally it's always been called that. But the enemy, the devil, how many of those, the devil is the king inti- imitator. Everything that God has ever done, the devil has always tried to create a counterfeit of that. 
Even when people are touched by the presence of God, it's called drinking the new wine. It's called being drunk in the new wine. That's what happened in Acts chapter 2. They were worshiping God with such an intensity that they said, these guys are drunk. And it's in the morning. What's wrong with these people? They're already drunk. Peter said, no, wait a minute. These are not drunk as you suppose. They are drunk, but they're not drinking what you think they're drinking. They're drinking something that's not going to give them a hangover. Come on, somebody. How many of us, we drink to forget. We drink to relax. We drink to be confident. We drink all these things, and it's all, it is all a counterfeit of what the Holy Spirit wants to be to us. How many of us, he wants to help us be confident. He wants us to help us be bold. He wants to help us deal with our problems. But more than just helping us deal with our problems in the moment, he can actually fix our problems. Where the thing that the devil offers us cannot fix anything. Can I get an amen? amen? So my answer to the question is no, it is not biblically a sin to drink al- alcohol. Yes, it biblically is a sin to be a drunk because when you become a drunk, you are even, even buzz, you've heard even the commercials, buzz driving is drunk driving. When you get to a place where your mind is altered, where you no longer have control over your thoughts and your intentions, then you have moved into something where you've allowed another spirit to control you. You still love me? Say amen. If you quit the church over that one right there, you're getting mad at me over that one right there, then whew, you got to ask yourself, what's the most important thing? Number two, and I'm going to do this one fast, and I thought I was going to skip this one, but I can't skip it. It's the most difficult one of all. Do pets go to heaven? This is by far the most asked question. It's unbelievable. People want to know if the ha- animals are going to heaven. They even made a movie about it. Do all dogs go to heaven? Poor cats. How many of those ain't nobody ever said all cats go to heaven? Some of y'all think cats are full of the devil. Huh? No, cats are not full of the devil. So, what is our final authority? What? Jesus is, yes. What is our final authority? The Bible. The Bible is our final authority. So, we have to look at the Bible. We can tell you this, that the Bible is not clear on this subject. Uh, we can look at a few scriptures that allude to it. And I gotta, I'm going to go quickly. I'm going to talk like this. So you might have to get the CD or do the people still get CDs? I started, I almost said, get the tape. I literally almost said, you might have to get the tape. What's the tape? Some, I literally, I'm going to ask you, sir, how many of y'all young folks have ever played a cassette tape in your life? Raise your hand. I'm shocked. How about an eight track? Oh, <laughs> you're sitting in the young folks section, but you ain't young. An eight track. Well, it's an eight track, but you remember the eight track? You jamming out to your song, and then right in the middle of the song, it stops. You got to wait for the track, track to change, and it changes the next track. Boom, your song picks back up. Y'all don't even know the struggle is real, baby. Y'all do not know what we had to go through. See, God created man and animals both from the ground. God cares for animals. There's no doubt that God loves animals. Can I get an amen? Amen. The difference between man and animals, though, is that man is the only thing in creation that's ever been created in the image of God. One of the things about being created in the image of God is that we are a three-part being, just like God is one God who exists and manifests himself in three parts. We serve one God that exists in Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I am one Larry, but I exist. My, my, the real Larry is the spirit man. I possess a soul, which is my mind, my emotions, my intellect, and I live in a body. So I'm a three-part person created in the image of God. So our, my spirit is eternal. My spirit, sep- the spirit man of me, separates me from all other things that were created uh, during creation in the book of Genesis. Because I and you are the only part of creation that has a spirit man. Therefore, I hate to tell you this, but Fido, uh, Buddy, Rover. Rover, the people still name their dogs Rover. AJ, 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 I love you. That's my dog. Or whatever your dog's name or your cat's name or your fish's name or your snake's name or your salamander's name or whatever it is, if it's your pet, let me tell you something about that pet. Your pet has a soul because the soul is the emotions, the mind, and the intellect. How many, how many knows that animals have emotions and animals can learn things? Certainly, the animals that are domesticated in our life, they are, can be extremely smart, extremely emotional. You can see them when they're sad. You can see when they're happy. Am I right? That's true. Therefore, they have a soul, but they do not have a spirit. 
Because if they did, then they would be equal with man. And the Bible says man was made just a little bit lower than the angels. So, so it doesn't say anything about animals, but man is there. So man, watch this, is creating the image of God. Man certainly is the one that is promised an eternal home. If you serve the Lord, you're going to heaven. If you don't serve the Lord, you're going to a place called hell. But that's, the question is, what about our animals? Are they going to be there? Well, a couple of things you got to remember, and this may surprise you, and some of you know it, but every once in a while you're going to be reminded of it because we forget it, is that we assume that our eternal home for all eternity as Christians is heaven. Heaven is not our eternal home. I want to show it to you in scripture a little bit today, but in a future message series, I'm going to preach in depth on this to really explain future events. But watch this. If the rapture was to take place today, you ever heard of the rapture? Say amen. Amen. Now, if you don't understand what the rapture is, that's when Jesus comes to get his people and he's going to take us to heaven with him. If the rapture was to take place, even at this very second, then scripture teaches us that right after that rapture, there's something called a seven year tribulation period. And during that tribulation period, all these horrible things are going to happen on this earth. But at the end of that tribulation period, the Bible records an instance where Jesus is going to stand up, mount a white horse, and he's going to come back to this earth. And the Bible says, and all of heaven, all of us that are in heaven with him that has been raptured seven years from now, will come back with him and will be, he'll, he'll fight the battle of Armageddon on his own. And the battle of Armageddon will end. The Bible says he'll put one foot on the, on, the, on the mountain and one foot in the sea and declare that there is no more delay. And at the end of the tribulation period will happen and something will begin called the millennial reign. Have you ever heard the millennial reign? The millennial reign is a thousand year reign where the devil, praise God, I love this part, is thrown into a pit and locked up and shut up. I love, the, I love that in the King James says, and he will be shut up for a thousand years. I know that means to lock the door, but every time I read it, I always go, ha, ha, I ain't got to hear your mouth for a thousand years. Huh? I ain't got time to preach it because after that he's loose for a little season and all this. But what I'm trying to tell you is from the millennial reign to the new heaven and new earth that will be refined at the end of the millennial reign, we are here on this earth with Jesus. Our eternal home is not heaven. We will be there temporarily. Our eternal home is this earth. Why is it? Because heaven was not created for us. The earth was created for us. This is our kingdom. This is where God gave us the meaning. This is where eternally a new heaven and a new earth and Jesus will be here with us. The new Jerusalem will come down. It will set right on the original dimensions of the Garden of Eden and we will live forever here on this earth and rule and reign for all eternity here on this earth in our glorified bodies. But here's the interesting thing about that. During the millennial reign, which is those thousand years that proceeds uh, the eternity here on this earth, Isaiah talks about that millennial reign, and listen to what he says. This, remember, this is post-rapture. This is post our glorified bodies. This is the corruptible putting on the incorruptible. We are now living in our eternity at this point. Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 8 says about the millennial reign. It's no doubt it's talking about the millennial reign. The wolf will lay down with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. A little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child, listen to this, this is amazing, will play by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain. For the earth, somebody shout the earth. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So we see during the millennial reign, every kind of animal uh, that you can imagine is going to be here. So we know eternal wise animals are going to exist at the very least in the millennial reign. We just read that, right? So that tells me at least we have scriptural evidence that animals are going to exist in eternity. Now, I don't have a scripture to show you in the new heavens and the new earth they're going to be here, but I got a feeling they're going to be. That's just my opinion on that part there because I don't have scripture to show that. So the question is, do all pets go to heaven? Well, where do you draw the line then? Okay. And I'm going to show you why I'm going to ask you where do you draw the line? Because I've, I've had pet fish. Huh? And how many of those I had some pet fish that lasted for a few months? I had some that lasted the day I got them. And they went on to be with, with the Lord in fish heaven, wherever that's at. 
So where do you draw the line? Is every fish that's ever died, every, every lizard you got out of the yard and called your pet and walked around and showed everybody and you loved him and named him and all that, every animal that you've ever had, is that, are they all going to go to heaven with you? I would say chances are probably not. Here is my opinion, and I'm going to move on. Here's why I feel like that probably the animals that you love the most have got a really good shot of being with you in eternity in your portion of the New Jerusalem, in your giant room the size of a mansion the Bible tells about, is because at the core of everything about how the Lord feels about us, he said, if we delight ourselves in the ways of the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. So I've always imagined my mansion is like this Holy Ghost, supernatural Jesus man cave for Larry. Praise God. I'm talking about, I, I used to drink Mountain Dew. I don't drink Mountain Dew anymore, so I've got to adjust this. But I used to say, God, I want a Mountain Dew fountain sitting right next to my recliner with unlimited little Debbie Swiss rolls. Praise God. <laughs> Because there is no calories in heaven. Can I get an amen? Nah. Hallelujah. I'm actually just going to lean over my chair and just stick my mouth under the fountain. Praise God. Who knows what it's going to look like? This is just me making it all up. If that's the case, if God's going to give me there what means the most to me that gives me joy, then I got to know that AJ's going to be there with me. So I think that. I think that. I can't prove that. So I'm sorry that I can't tell you emphatically that that part of your family is going to be there. I can, I can give you this, though. I can tell you that I don't have any scripture that emphatically tells me that they're not going to be there. If I did not have any example that animals would exist in eternal situations, then that would be a little more troubling. But we know that animals exist in, in the eternity that God promised us. So therefore, I'm just going to choose to believe that AJ is going to be with me. Is that all right? Moving on. 1209, if you're taking medicine. Look at your neighbor and tell him you really need to pray for Pastor. Question number three, can a Christian be gay? Well, the first thing I want to tell you before I get into this, do we all know what gay means? Happy. happy. So the answer to the question, can a Christian be gay, is yes, be happy. Next question. Just kidding. <laughs> I wish it was that easy. Woo, I wish it was that easy. I don't think the person and the persons, because this was multiple people in various angles of this question meant, is it okay for a Christian to be happy? Uh, although that could be a good question too, because some of the most miserable people I've ever seen are in church for another day in another sermon. Let me begin to say that I want to remind you, what is our final authority? The Bible. The Bible is our final authority. And remember what we said, when the, if the Bible speaks clearly on a subject, then we're going to let the Bible speak on the subject. Can I tell you that very few of these questions can I emphatically say, because of how the questions are asked, that the Bible speaks clearly on this subject. And you may not like what the Bible says on the subject, as, as Austin was talking about during worship. Nowadays, we're moved more by our emotions than what the Word of God says. We cannot live by emotions. We have, if we are believers and we are Christians, we are supposed to live by what the Word of God says, not by what man says and not by what you feel. Are you all alive? Some preachers are trying to elude that the Bible is not clear on this subject, but they are twisting and many of them are rewriting. In fact, Dr. Michael Brown, which I will quote in just a few minutes, who is a foremost expert on this subject and has debated in many colleges, he has preached in this pulpit, he is a phenomenal, phenomenal man of God. Um, he has just on one of his recent podcasts revealed that there are a group of pastors who, are, who believe that that uh, the answer to that question is emphatically, yes, you can be gay and be a Christian. You can be happily married in your, in your homosexual relationship. Pastors can pastor that are homosexuals and many different things. That they are currently, listen to me, this according to Dr. Michael Brown, they are rewriting the Bible and they're creating their own version of the Bible that supports it because they believe, the, they say that they've found some original thought that had been passed down, not even no writings to base it on, but they found people who have philosophized, philosophized, is that a word, over the years, and, 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 and alluded to, to matching their opinion, and now they are rewriting and making their own Bible to support that God does not look at homosexuality as a sin. Let me just say this with love, because I'm going to tell you something, in this church, we're going to always speak with love, we're going to speak in truth, we're going to speak in love, we're going to be life-giving. These preachers will stand before God, because the Word of God says, you shall not add or take away any word 
Come on, from this Bible, if you do, the plagues that are mentioned in the Bible shall be added to you. That's what Scripture says. So that's a warning. One of the main reasons that people are even asking this question repeatedly every time I ever do this is because of a very sneaky, patient, and consistent desensitizing of the culture of this country and the world. And the media are very willing accomplices. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but the truth be known, everyone in this room probably has someone in their family who is gay or lesbian, has a co-worker uh, that is struggling with this, has friends. You know what? You may be struggling with it. Because I'm, I've been doing this long enough to know that in a crowd this size, there probably is one or more people in this room right now that are struggling with same-sex attraction. I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, for your friends, for your loved ones, and for you personally, I'm not judging you. I'm not speaking down to you. I'm not saying that God does not love you. I'm not saying that God does not want to use you because God does want to use you for the kingdom. But I have to speak what the word of God says. If not, I will answer to God. If I'm not going to preach the Bible, then what am I doing in this pulpit? If I'm not going to be a pastor, then why am I pastoring this church? If you do not want to go to church and be equipped for the work of the ministry by your pastor, then why are you here? Do you want your pastor to preach? Come on. Now, now I'm not going to preach mean up here. I'm not preaching judgmental. I never have been mean, but I used to be guilty of the cliches that all preachers were guilty of. You know, the most famous one was, you know, we always preached it like this because we preached to the crowd. And we'd say, you know, in the beginning, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And the church would be, oh, that's right. That's a funny little thing to say. But one service, I was saying that back in the barn. I'll never forget it. I said those exact words, and the whole church laughed and shouted me down. I had a great time. Soon as service was over with, this woman had been coming to our church for a long time, came up to me and basically openly rebuked me at the back door and just said, Pastor, I love you, but I've been inviting, I can't remember if it was her daughter or granddaughter, she said, I've been inviting her for months to come to church with me. And she finally comes. She has been a lesbian her entire life. And, and she said that when you said that, she realized, she leaned over at me and said, I'll never be back. I was listening to him. Now, you, you automatically say, what a cop-out. What a cop-out. Could they not have taken that? But the way I said it was not right. Because what happened was, instead of speaking that God loves them and wants to help them and wants to bring them through uh, into where God wants them to be in this perfect will of their life, I, I said a, a, a religious reaction and it shut down any opportunity that I had uh, to mi minister to that girl. And I learned my lesson then. When I say that, I mean I didn't compromise, and I'm not compromising because we emphatically stand on the principles of the Word of God. But the way we're going to reach people is we've got to show them that God loves them. God loves everyone, but God has a perfect will for our lives, and He wants us to go into that direction and not be moved by our own selfish, lustful thoughts and intentions. Can I get an amen? amen. See, this church is not anti-gay. This church is not hateful. We do not speak in a spirit of hate or prejudice on any level. I'm simply as a pastor trying to answer a question that was asked by many and is being asked by many in our modern culture. So what is our final authority? It's the Bible. Let's look at it. Immediately when I read these two scriptures, immediately, these are the two scriptures that's always quoted against the sin of homosexuality. You're, if you do not believe what I'm saying, you're going to say, well, that's the Old Testament. We're not in the Old Testament anymore. But hear me out. Leviticus 18.22 says, you shall not lie with a male, this is speaking to the men, as with a woman, it is an abomination. Leviticus 20, 13 says, if a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They will surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. In the Old Testament law, this was not the only sexual sin that was punishable by death. Adultery was punishable by death. Rape was punishable by death. Many different sexual things that would happen was punishable by death, not just homosexuality, but it was very clear. Well, thank God for the New Testament. Somebody say, thank God for the New Testament. Are you glad that Jesus died on the cross for, and gave us access to the kingdom of God? But wait a minute. Wait a minute. The New Testament says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Listen to this list here. This is what I was talking about a while ago about alcohol. It's not a sin to drink alcohol, but it's a sin to be a drunkard. Listen to what he says about drunkards. He says, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, which by the way, the Bible is explicitly clear about your heterosexual premarital sex as he is clear about homosexual sex. It's, it's the same sin. 
Are y'all hearing me? So don't you be shouting me down when we're talking about homosexuality, but yet you're still hooking up with your brother and your sister. Not brother and sister. We ain't in Tennessee. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, please help me get out of this hole, God. I mean, when you ain't hooking up, <laughs> when you ain't hooking up with whoever, you think it's okay. It ain't okay. Woo, is it getting hot in here? Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty clear. New Testament. New Testament, Romans chapter 1 is talking about the end times. He said, this is one of the signs that you'll know it's the end times. Verse 26 says, for this reason, he talks about the condition of the world that's going to be. It says, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Let me tell you what that means. That means that God gave us, other than, you know, here's the reality. God gave us dominion. In other words, he gave us the right to de decide to live any way we wanted to live and to do anything we wanted to do. But just because he gave us the right to do it doesn't mean if it feels good, do it. That if it feels good and then you do it, it doesn't make it right. If you want to live as a believer, how many believes, if you're a Christian in here, say amen. amen. If you're a Christian and you've taken on the name Christian over your life, that means you have taken on the anointing of God. That's what Christ means. It means his anointed one or his anointing. So you've taken on his anointing. You've taken on the name of, of, of what they called the believers early in those days of followers of Christ. So there's a certain standard that we have to live by. And he makes it very, very clear that it is shameful. It is not natural, and it goes on to say that it is sin. So our ground rules, remember, the Bible is our final authority. So the Scripture will answer this question, not me. Yes, listen to me, homosexual sex is a sin. Do you notice what, what I just said? Homosexual sex is a sin. Heterosexual outside of marriage sex is a sin. Are y'all hearing me? In fact, the only sexual relations that you can have with anybody that has the blessings of God on it is if you are one man and one woman and you are together in holy matrimony and you have made that covenant and commitment to you in marriage and then you have sex, God says he will. The bed of the married couple is undefiled. Are you hearing me? Hmm. So the next question is this, because some people are going to say this, but aren't some people born gay? They, they don't want to be that way. They're born that way. They've been, they've been that way their whole life. Well, I'm not going to attempt anything about birth. I'm not going to attempt to answer any medical questions. I'm not qualified for that. But I will say this, that I know, that I know because the culture that we live in and the media that we live in are such willing accomplices, I can promise you this. If there was emphatic medical proof that they could prove that someone was born gay, we would already know about it. So they've tried and tried and tried to find something. But, but it's, how can you do that? How can, you, how can you look at a baby and do a DNA test on them and, and tell us that they were born with some kind of DNA gene that's going to make them heterosexual or homosexual? Sin is sin. So here's the question. Here's the answer to that question. Are people born gay? Well, I want to ask you a question this. Are people born alcoholics? Are people born murderers? Are people born liars? We're all born in sin. Therefore, we are, our nature of which we are born into, are, we are going to gravitate to different sins in our life. And, it's, and, and many times our culture and environment in which we live in feeds that. So therefore, let's think about this. Some, some babies are born with alcohol in their blood system because their mothers were drunk when they birthed them. Heroin, crack in their system. 
That's a criminal offense today. Do you know that? Should be. And here's the reality. Most of those kids, without help, without direction, without counseling and treatment, many of them will end up being alcoholics and drug addicts. And, it's, and what happens is, mentally, they tell themselves, well, I really had no other choice. I was born an alcoholic. I really had no other choice. The day I, my mama told me when I was born, I had alcohol in my system. I had, had drugs in my system. So what was I going to do? That's all I ever knew. But for everyone that said that, there's others that were born with alcohol in their blood and they never took a drop. There were others that was born with drugs in their system and they never took drugs in their life. Why? Because they allowed God to come in and do a work in their life. Does that mean that they would not be naturally tempted to want to drink alcohol in the future? No. How many of those, once you're saved, it doesn't take away the temptation? How many of those I'm preaching right? I'm talking about you. No matter what you've been delivered from, thank God you've been delivered from it. You've been born again. But if you are not careful, if you do not make sure that you put yourself in the proper environment and stay, stay out of the improper environment that will bring upon those temptations, you are still naturally going to be drawn to those things that have always been a problem for you. So if God delivered you from, from being an alcoholic, you know, probably what happens is somebody, see, I see this happen all the time, people are so excited that God's delivered them from alcoholism. It's such an amazing thing because that's all they've ever known is to drink every day of their life. The first place they want to go to win everybody to Jesus is where? The bar. They want to go to the bar because that's where all their friends are. I, and they, they're so excited when they tell me that and I say, oh, time out, time out, time out. I hear what you're saying. Do not do that. Do not go back to that bar. I don't care how clean you are. I don't care how powerfully anointed you are. You are not as strong as you think you are. So when God delivers you from anything, whether it be a sexual sin, heterosexual sin, homosexual sin, the one thing you need to do is to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people who are going to speak life into you, not judgmental, but life into you, to keep you in an environment that's going to keep you focused on what God is trying to do in your life, not your tendencies. Am I preaching right? So, let me hurry up. I might well get to question four again. Sorry. Another question. Unless y'all want me to go overtime, that's up to y'all. Okay, how many wants just a few minutes overtime? Rest of y'all, it's their fault. So my, I got to finish this though. So my answer to this question may surprise you. The question is, can someone struggle with homosexuality and be a Christian? The answer to that question is absolutely yes. So you can be a Christian and be attracted to the same sex. You can be a Christian and attracted to somebody else's wife. Huh? Or husband. Come on, somebody. You can be a Christian and be on the job and be going through bad financial times and see money laying somewhere and be tempted to take it. That's the nature of man. But now I know, I know Jesus said, if you lust in your heart, you've, you've committed adultery. I know what he said. I, don't, I, don't, I certainly would never dispute what Jesus said. What I'm trying to tell you is this. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 from the King James Version, that when these thoughts come into our mind, even as believers, that we are to cast down imagination. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So even though you're attracted and, and being drawn into something, you, you just have to say to yourself, oh, no, I'll re- in the name of Jesus, I bring that thought into captivity. Because that is not who I am. That is not who I've created to be. But you can't do that on your own. Let me tell you something. If you try to do that on your own, you can't do it on your own. You need help. You need people you can trust. You need people you can pray for you. And I know you might be scared if you're struggling with that. You might be scared to think, well, that's something I can't confess to anybody. Let me tell you something. There are people in this, in this house who need to really pray about it. This is a safe place where nobody's going to judge you. They're going to love you. They're not going to throw you out. We don't throw people away. Can I get an amen? We do, I said we don't throw people away in this house. Can I get an amen? We don't, we don't wash our hands of people. We don't disqualify people. We love them. I'll say it emphatically. A gay couple, a lesbian couple, are as welcome as this, at this church as you are. We will love them. We will welcome them. We'll shake their hand. We'll give them a worship guide. We'll treat them no differently than we treat you. They can raise their hands and worship God if they want to. Nobody's going to come and say, well, you can't worship God. That, they can worship God all they want to. But when it comes time for them to make the next step in their walk with God in a loving way, we're going to talk to them and give them our opinion. 
But hopefully by that time, they would have felt loved. They would have felt accepted in the hands of God. And their hearts would be ready to have a teachable spirit. If they really, really, really want to be okay to be where God wants them to be, then maybe the door will be open to us. Maybe not. Maybe they don't want to hear that. But the reality is this. We will not compromise the convictions of the Word of God. We will not change for the culture. We will not be moved by emotions in this house. We will love people. We will welcome people. But we will preach the Word of God in this house. I wish somebody would give him praise right now. Oh, oh and lastly, because I've got to tell you this. Because for people that don't believe that somebody can be healed or delivered from, from, from homosexuality or, or any other temptation or sin... Remember that scripture I just read where I listed the liars, the idolaters, the adulterers, the fornicators that could not enter the kingdom of heaven? Homosexuality and sodomy was listed as well. Those, that was 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. I left out verse 11 on purpose just so that I could finish with this because verse 11, right after all those lists, Paul says, as such were some of you, but you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. In other words, he says, everything that I just listed, some of you were every single one of them, but you are no longer them because you were washed and sanctified and justified by the name of Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Can I get an amen? amen. Give him praise. Whew. All right, 1228, going into overtime. Y'all ready? Last question, question number four is simply this. Is there a difference between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus Christ? I'm going to do as fast as I can. The rapture of the church, this is, these, these are my interpretation of eschatology, by the way. Eschatology is the study of end times. This is my interpretation. There are so many different interpretations of this. So whatever you want to go with, you can go with. But I can tell you where I stand as your pastor. In fact, and quite frankly, this is what, what our church stands for, and this is what we will preach. We believe in the rapture. Even though the rapture is not mentioned in Scripture, the word rapture, the rapture is certainly mentioned in Scripture. I'll show you that in just a minute. The word rapture is an English translation. of uh, uh, It's a new word that was invented, uh, created to... Uh, describe the catching away of the saints is what the rapture means. Uh, the rapture of the church. This is when all true believers in Christ will be taken from the earth by God into heaven. First Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 and 52 says this, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Somebody shall change. So this is the rapture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 says this, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of an archangel, at the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, in the air. Everybody say, in the air. That's very, very key. In the air. And thus shall we always view the Lord. In other words, there's something going to happen on this earth that is going to be triggered by the Lord leaving heaven, sitting on a cloud, a trumpet being blown, and something happening to all of us, the dead in Christ will rise, then all of us who are alive, if it happened right now, we're talking about us, we would be changed immediately, we would put on our glorified bodies, and we would ascend to be with the Lord. That's what he said, in the air. And then the most powerful thing, this is why the Bible says, comfort one another with these words, this is your promise. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. In other words, when we go up to meet him, he's going to take us to heaven with him. He's going to bring us back to earth with him. Wherever he goes from the point of these scriptures, he will never go anywhere without us. Come on, somebody. Is that awesome? Is that awesome? We go everywhere he goes. There'll never be a moment in eternity that we will ever exist that Jesus is not in our midst. That's what the scripture just said. Before I break it down very quickly, the second coming of Christ is completely different. This will happen, as I've already alluded to it a couple of times today, when Jesus Christ returns to the earth to defeat the Antichrist, to overthrow evil and then establish a thousand year reign. We go to meet him in the air at the rapture. We come back with him to the earth to set up his kingdom. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16 says this. 
Now I saw heaven open. This is the end of the tribulation period. Go study Revelation. You'll find this is well at the end of the tribulation period. Now I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And his, in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except he himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Isn't it awesome that here we are at the end, he's still called the Word of God, and John chapter 1 said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In heaven, he still is known as the Word of God, and his name is called the Word of God, and the armies in heaven, that's us and all the angels, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. We know that because the Bible says that's the way we'll be dressed. Followed him on white horses. See, if you never rode a horse in your life, you're going to get to ride one one day. And the Bible says, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath. Everybody say wrath. That's a key word. The wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and his thigh a name written. Woo, glory to God. King of kings and Lord of lords. Is there any doubt who we're talking about? There's absolutely zero doubt we're talking about Jesus, right? So we know that Jesus, we will meet Jesus in the air, and so shall we ever be the Lord. And then we read about Jesus who names him the word of God, names him king of kings, Lord of lords, and says he will mount a horse, and then everything in heaven, all the armies and the soldiers of heaven with him will also mount the horse and come back with him. But watch what it says. The Bible says there is a sword in his mouth. For vengeance. Because at that point, at the, here on this earth, will be the culmination of the, of the tribulation period, which will be split right down the middle in what is known as tribulation period and then the great tribulation period. Three and a half years and three and a half years. 1260 days, 1260 days on the Jewish calendar. In fact, Jesus talked about it and he said, listen, and we, it took us in the modern time to even realize what he meant. He was describing that tribulation period being so horrible and so horrific. He said, unless those days be shortened, no flesh should even survive. So what did that mean? That meant that in that day, he knew that in that day, we would be operating by what is known as a Gregorian calendar that instituted a couple of thousand years ago at the birth of Christ. The Roman Catholic Church instituted it and the monks instituted it. But the Roman Catholic Gregorian calendar says that we have 365.25 days per year. That 0.25 is where we pick up the Roman, uh, where we pick up the um, leap year. So 365 days. But a Jewish calendar has 360 days on it. So everything that's calculated in Scripture is calculated on the Jewish calendar. So the reality is this. What he's trying to say is that, that the seven-year tribulation period is not based on seven years of 365.25 days. It's based on, it, speci it speaks specifically of the number of days, and it tells us it's 1,260 days in the first half, 1,260 days in the second half. And then he knew in this generation, if we were operating by the Gregorian calendar, the tribulation period was going to be so horrific, not a single human being would, he, would be able to survive the destruction that is going to come on this earth. Is that mind-blowing? At the end of that, the Bible says, because of the Antichrist and the false prophet and many different things, that all the existing armies of the world will say, we've got rid of God, we've got rid of all his church people. The only thing that's left is we need to get rid of his name and we need to blow up Jerusalem. So they all come together, they rebuild the temple, they do all this kind of stuff, and they, they destroy every religion, they make one world religion. And in the name of religion, in the name of politics, they all come together, and the Bible says they gather in a valley that's called the Valley of Megiddo, which is also known as Armageddon. And that's the Battle of Armageddon. And they, the Bible says they, they will see Jesus coming through the crowds on that white horse and all of us. And they are, they are fighting the remnants of the Jewish people that are still left. They're trying to wipe them out because they feel like if they could kill the existing remnants of the Jewish people, there'd be no evidence of God left. And as they're trying to kill the Jewish people, they will see Jesus. And the Bible tells us specifically that they will move their guns away from the Jewish people and point their guns directly at Jesus. And they will try to blow Jesus out of the sky and all of us mistake because the Bible says he will speak one word out of his mouth Isaiah says one word comes out of his mouth and when that word comes out of his mouth every enemy is completely killed and destroyed in an instant that's scripture and the Bible says at that point we won't fight it it's not our fight the battle is not ours the battle is the Lord's we're spectators and when that battle is ended the Bible says he will then come that's what's called the second coming 
back to the earth. He will put his one foot on the mountain, one foot in the sea. And when he does, it will cause an earthquake. And the Bible says the mountain will open up. And when the mountain opens up, to this day, it's scientifically proven. They have, they have satellite pictures of it. Israel, one of the reasons that people want to take over Israel is because it's an unexplained to the rest of the world. But underneath Israel is one of the largest deposits of natural water in the world. Clean drinking water underneath the nation of Israel spills over a little bit in some of the other Middle Eastern countries, but they, they, they say they want it for this and this and this, but they're running out of water over there. That's going to be one of the reasons that they go after Israel to try to take their water. But the Bible says that when Jesus puts his foot on the ground, just like this split in the stages here, the Bible says the mountain is going to split and all of that water is going to gush out, go down into the streets of Jerusalem, go into the Dead Sea where nothing has ever lived or existed. The Bible says it's going to heal the Dead Sea and all of the fish from the Mediterranean Sea are going to be brought into it and the millennial reign is going to begin and we're going to walk down to the Dead Sea, which used to be the Dead Sea. And for a thousand years, we're going to fish, we're we're going to be able to take food out of things that no one ever this is all biblical this is all bible that all happens at the second coming of christ all right just a couple more minutes the difference in the rapture and the second coming is this one is a meeting in the air versus one is returning with him they're not the same okay we've already shown you that two one, depending on what you believe, some people believe in pre-tribulation rapture, some believe in mid-tribulation rapture, some even believe in post-tribulation rapture. And I will say this emphatically, I don't understand how anybody can believe in post-tribulation rapture because of what I'm about to say. Uh, there's a chance of a mid-tribulation, maybe. I tend to believe it's 100% pre-tribulation rapture. Here's why. Watch this. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, this is enough for me. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is without a doubt the second coming of Christ is tied to the battle of Armageddon, and that is the wrath of God being poured out on the enemies of God. We have not been given and prepared to receive the wrath of God as his believers. So he, that, that alone. Revelation 3.10 says this, because you have kept my commandments, this is speaking to the church, to the last day church, my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So we have one scripture telling us that we've not been given to his wrath, appointed to wrath. We have another scripture saying there's going to come a season, an hour of trial and devastation to come on the whole world. Not just what parts of the world, but the whole world. You will be kept from it. That's because we will already been raptured. The second coming will happen at the end of the tribulation period, as I have said. Read chapter 6 through 19 of Revelation and you'll see. Bottom line, in my opinion, the rapture cannot take, it, take place at any... Bottom line is this. The Bible tells us that we know not the day nor the hour, Right? Except our Father in heaven, which means the rapture can take place at any time. Do you believe the rapture can take place right now? Do you believe that Jesus can come get us right now if he wanted to? But wait a minute. If you believe the rapture and the second coming are the same thing, then that don't line up because the second coming can only happen after certain events take place. The rapture can happen at any moment. The second coming has to happen after all the valley of Megiddo was filled. He starts listing all these things that happen, and then the Lord sits up and gets on his horse. So none of that's happening now. So the second coming can't happen right now, but the rapture could. They're not the same. And then the last thing is this. In the rapture, believers are taken from the earth by God as an act of deliverance. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 says this, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, dead, lest you sorrow as others have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so we bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, Je Je what he's saying is Jesus knows where all your loved ones are. Even if you've got to put them back together and recreate them. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of our archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. The lastly is this, one is hidden, one is seen by all. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 15 through 54. You can read it for yourself. It says we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And the Bible alludes to the fact that the rapture will be instantaneous and be a hidden event. Two, two will be 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50, 50 through 54. Watch this. Two will be in the field, one will be taken, and one will be remained. So you see it over and over again where this movie has been made about it. It's very clear in Scripture that instantaneously millions, if not billions of people are going to disappear from this earth. It's going to be explained that the aliens got us. Huh? All kinds of things try to explain what happened to all these people. The other one, the second coming, is seen by all. They, because the Bible clearly says that they turn their guns towards Jesus. They can see him in all of us. So one is a hidden event, an instantaneous event. One is another event that is built up and people can see it coming. It's not the same. So you can see there's a difference. But here's the reality. You want to be a part of that first one that's hidden and instantaneous? Then you need to know your life is right with God. Because remember it says, the dead in Christ, not the dead, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, still talking about in Christ, will be caught up. That's where the word, what the word rapture means, caught up. Will be raptured or caught up to, the, to meet the Lord in the air. I've often said it this way. I said, I hope, I know it's an instantaneous thing. I know it's a, a thing that only we will see and the angels will see. But man, I hope that even though it's instantaneous, I hope at some point he just lets it be slow-mo. Because when I'm going up in the air, man, I want to look around and see some folks. I want to high-five some folks. We made it, y'all! Yeah! I, mean, I mean, Jesus, we all want to get to Jesus. But man, I just, I just want to look over, just see some of y'all. We'll see each other for all eternity, but wouldn't it be cool if he just sort of super slow-moed the moment for us? We can just say, yeah. Who knows? Have y'all enjoyed this today? Come on, give the Lord a praise right now. 15 minutes overtime. Get up on your feet. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for a church that allows their pastor to speak on sensitive issues. Show us what the scripture said, because obviously, God, ultimately, that's what we care about, and that's what we want to see, is what the Word of God says. Father, we pray that you would let the Word of God sink deep within us, not be received by any kind of spirit of judgment, bitterness, anger, hatred, but it will be received by a loving and graceful heart of a church that's just trying to help. And Father, as that last question that we addressed, we believe Jesus that you are coming soon. We believe that you are preparing that final generation. And I believe personally that we are that final generation. So if there's ever been a time that we need to be looking for your appearing, if there's ever been a time that we need to be expecting that you could come at any moment, it is now.